Welcome to the Black Doctors Talk Podcast. I am Dr. Christopher Holmes, host for this episode and member of the Black Doctoral Network. Today, I am joined by Dr. Felicia Bowen, who is a veteran, professor, and nurse scientist with clinical expertise in pediatric asthma and health disparities. Welcome, Dr. Bowen. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Holmes. Listen, I told you before, I'm excited to have you. My wife is a nurse as well, so I am definitely intrigued by the work that you do, but also honored by the work that you do. Thanks. Appreciate that. So first, I would like for you to start by telling our viewers and our listeners a little bit about your background. Where does it all begin for you? Wow. So um, me in a couple of minutes here. So I am a military brat. My dad was in the army and um, I've lived many, many places in the U.S. and abroad. And through those experiences, I've seen people who have been very well off. And I've also seen situations where people have just struggled to make it through the day. Um, I graduated high school in Germany um, and went to school at Tuskegee, Alabama. And so that was a fabulous experience um, being at that HBCU, but it was also extremely enlightening for me because Tuskegee is located in Macon County, Alabama, and that is the poorest county in Alabama. It's the county where the Tuskegee experiment took place. Um, and I had really not experienced abject poverty. Um, I didn't know that's what it was called, but I just, I had not seen anything like that. Um, and I, I had the sense of, you know, something's not right. Everybody deserves a healthy life. Um, I had an ROTC scholarship, uh, went on to active duty. And through that experience, I saw the other side of the military, right? So I was a nurse and I had an opportunity to provide care um, to uh, military veterans and dependents. And although those folks weren't rich, you know, people in the army don't make a lot of money, they have really good health care. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had an opportunity to take care of young folks and old folks. And I saw that there was a huge issue with chronic disorders, diabetes, heart failure, hypertension, asthma. And so pondering those things, I thought, you know, where do we make inroads here? Um, and I thought, I really do believe that if we want to address healthy lifestyles and have healthier individuals, it starts during childhood. People just don't wake up, right? And you're 18 and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I have heart failure or I have asthma. So it's all of those lifestyle things that, um, that occur when we're children that lead up to um, our ability to be healthy adults. And um, so that is where that health disparities and that interest with um, pediatric healthcare came along. Um, I, I was working, one of my first jobs as a pediatric nurse practitioner was um, in a small minority community, Asbury Park, mm -hmm. um, very underserved community in, um, in uh, New Jersey over by the shore. And you can go like a mile one way and there are mansions on the shore, right? Yeah, and then, I hear you know, Wendy Williams talk about Asbury Park, so I know what. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's a lot better now than when I was there when I first started practicing, um, but some of those same health disparities still um, exist. And so, you know, when I got there, it, it, it was like a small Newark, you know, when we looked at um, the, number of people who were infected with HIV AIDS, um, infant mortality, um, mental health disorders, drug abuse. Um, so, you know, that, that really caught my interest. And so I saw that I had these questions, didn't really know how to answer them. And that led me to um, getting my PhD. And so um, I earned my PhD from Columbia University, which was and still is known for the work of health disparities. Um, and you know, that just kind of launched me off from there. So, so long answer. <laughs> no, no, that was no perfect answer because now I've got more questions. I want to know more. <laughs> so as a nurse scientist, what does that look like day to day? 
Well, um, a nurse scientist is a nurse who has been trained um, in research. So we are the nurses who have PhDs, EDDs. Um, uh, we have been plain, trained in the discipline uh, to be able to conduct uh, independent research. And uh, so for me, I have a clinical background. Not every nurse practice, not every nurse scientist, I mean, other than being we're all nurses. Not everyone has that strong clinical focus where I'm a nurse practitioner, so I'm still caring for kids and their families. So the things that I see kind of my practice um, informs my research, uh, you know, so my practice informs my research. I practice in the community. So for me, my brain buzzes all the time. And when I look at problems, I don't just look at them like, wow, there's a problem, but I ask why, you know, and I ask, how did we get here? And so that background as a nurse scientist allows me um, to be able to look for solutions and when solutions or, or best practices and when they don't exist, then, hey, let's create a study so that we can find out more about how to, how to do this in this certain population. And um, there's different research methodologies and I am a community-based researcher. Some people call it action-oriented research in some disciplines. So I'm very um, much among the community. Um, I, I kind of travel the circuit where the kids are. So I'm in the schools, um, very involved with PTAs, the principals in town, the local school nurses, the health departments, and we are looking at data on children. And so how do we look at this data Sometimes we can come up with solutions just from looking at the data and working backwards. And then there's other times where we need to better understand the data. And so that may, um, you know, call for more qualitative work where I need to get folks together and talk to them, listen for themes, sometimes children, sometimes, you know, just their parents or, you know, folks in the community. Um, and then um, I, I also do a lot of interventions um, uh, around education and treatment. So that's that's my world as um, a researcher. It's data. I look at data and, and data is all around us, right? So um, it's like, we're sitting on a pile of this stuff. Let's do something with it. So um, that's what research um, and being a nurse scientist looks like for me, as, as well as dissemination. How do I get this information out? Um, here's something that we know that works. Here's a best practice. Why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we doing this more? And also from a research standpoint, I, I want my research to inform practice and policy. So, you know, how can I share the work and the outcomes that we have, that we know about, you know, with people who um, are making decisions, key stakeholders? Um, and sometimes that means, you know, if they don't listen, then how do you get to the table with them? You know, so there may be some elbow bumping to get to the table. Um, and, and I've also learned that sometimes the key stakeholders aren't really the people around the table. They're more like the people in the community. Folks at the table may be coming up with plans, but if they're disconnected from the community um, or the community of interest, you know, it's kind of like spinning your wheels. Mm. So we have to meet people where they are, find out what's important for, for them and, and work, with, work with, with groups of people um, to address issues. So you, you dropped so many buzzwords that just make my whole soul tingle a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I do want to ask you this question. One of the things that you said that was important to me is that there is data out there and what we have to do is do something with the data. Mm -hmm. How do we get people to care enough to look at that data to then turn that, that thinking into action? Um, I, I think it's two ways, right? Like you have to, so I, I have, I have two lenses that I look through, right? So I have the community lens or the patient lens, and then I have, you know, like this administrative policy bean counter kind of lens, right? So you have to have people on the policy side recognize that um, these issues are important. And so now I'm gonna step into my social justice box for a second. 
I'm ready. When we look at key stakeholders and people who sit around the t- table, there are not a lot of black and brown people around the table. And so if all you see is the majority, you know, then and that really doesn't, it really doesn't affect you, right? That's not my family. That's not my community that I live in. Um, I hear about it, but it doesn't touch me, you know? And so therefore it's not important to me because it's happening to those people over there. And so it's not important. Um, and then through my social justice and research lens, working with the community, um, it's empowering people to be able to have them say, yeah, this is important to us. You need to look at us. Mm -hmm. We do have power. Um, We do count. And a lot of times that's around elections, right? Nobody wants to hear from black and brown folks until it's time to cast a vote. Right. Um, And so, and getting getting people who are from under-resourced areas to really feel empowered. You know, a lot of times it really makes me sad when I hear people say, you know, we talk about this all the time and nothing happens, you know, or people come into our community and they want to, you know, test or have us fill out surveys or whatever, but nothing happens. So I think it's important to take that information that we found, bring it back to the community. You know, sometimes it's stuff they want to hear, sometimes it's not, but you know, this is the data that we gathered. This is the sense that we made from it. And then also validate with them. Yeah. You know, so sometimes I'll do things and we'll come up with, you know, maybe even if it's qualitative data, you know, ask those folks back, you know, invite them back to, to the table to say, hey, this is what we came up with. Do you agree with this? Mm-hmm. This is what it means to us. What does it mean to you? You know, and um, so people have to feel empowered. They have to feel like they care, like they make a difference, you know, like they, they, they are, um, their communities are worth, are worth fighting for. And um, then take that, take that same spirit and fight back to the policymakers. So um, I try to be that voice, um, but we need more, we need more black and brown people to be on boards, to be active, run for public office, um, go to meetings in the towns. I mean, even though you may not be sitting behind, you know, the podium or whatever, or the diocese, whatever they call those things, you know, let folks hear what you're thinking about, especially in terms of your health. And, and I'm not a public health person, I guess maybe because I do so much work in the community and I, I work closely with public health um, colleagues, you know, they, they have a saying that says um, health in all policies. So I don't care if it's even like, you know, I was in New Jersey, they, they, this was some time ago, um, we had a hefty gas tax that was coming down. And so you think like, well, what does gas tax have to do with health, Mm -hmm. right? What does that have to do with health? Well, it has a lot of things to do with health. If we open our minds and we think, if we think about home health aides and the home health, um, you know, home health providers, who's doing that work? Those are low paying, very important jobs. Mm -hmm. They're minimal wage jobs. A lot of times people who are going to other folks' homes, providing care to them, are getting subsidences themselves, Mm -hmm. right? So how do I get to my places of work? I have three clients that I need to see in a day. They may be five to 10 miles apart, right? So that means I have to have my vehicle. I've got to put gas in my vehicle. Even that increase of $5 more in gas expenses through the week is $20 a month is whether or not I can pay a light bill, a phone bill, maybe buy some meat, you know, for my table. How is that going to affect me? You know, maybe I can't afford to work in this position anymore, so I have to leave this job. How is that going to affect the person that needs that care, the person who's at home, who's relying on these folks to show up to their house to help them, you know, get bathed, get dressed? Um, So, you know, where is health? Where is health in all policies? You're going to knock a building down in a city. You know, we've got too many abandoned buildings, so we're going to get rid of blight. Yeah, that's good. But when we start knocking down these buildings and there's plumes of dust everywhere, what does that do to people who have respiratory disorders, asthma, COPD, cardiac disorders, right? And where is this blight? Probably not in the suburbs and the really rich areas. They are in the urban communities where, again, we have folks who are under-resourced. They may have no insurance, inadequate insurance, 
Um, maybe they have medications for their diseases. Maybe they don't. Maybe they have air conditioning. Maybe they don't. So I'm supposed to close my window, right, for, for a week while you smash things down around me and it's 100 degrees outside. So those types of things, you know, and, and I could go on and on, but there's always a connection back to health and um, a person's health status in every single policy that's passed. And so, you know, I think it's important for people um, to think along those lines and, you know, and to be able to use our voice for people who don't have a voice. And for me, that's children, right? Children don't, and, I, and you know, when I say a voice, it doesn't mean they can't talk because, you know, I have kids and they talk back and they scream and cry and all sorts of stuff, <laughs> but they don't have a political voice, yeah. right? They don't have a political voice. So how do we speak for those folks who have, who don't have a political voice? And so as, as I've grown up, um, I've had to do a lot of soul searching, right? Like, there might be one platform or policy that will do really well for me and my family, mm -hmm. right? My bank account, but I have to consider the people that I work for and the greater good. Yeah. And so um, maybe I have to put my, my 401k aside and think about how, which policy is going to be better to help the majority. And unfortunately in this country, the majority are poor people or people who are just getting by. Yeah. You said powerful things. I love the, the idea of health in all policy. And um, until we can get to the point where we focus on the greater good, we're going to always have major issues here in this country and always have some level of disparity, uh, whether it be uh, economic or in um, health. It's just a, it's a big issue. Um, so we could go on and on because you are dropping great nuggets and I love, I'm loving the conversation. <laughs> um, so let me ask you another question. So let's take off your scientist hat and let's put on your professor hat. Okay. And as I hear you speak, I hear the passion uh, for what you do. So as a professor, what impact do you desire to have on your students? Um, I call them my nurselings, the ones that work really closely with me, right? So the, the folks that I mentor, but whether they're my nurselings or they're just another nursing student that I'm, I'm teaching, I want them to come out and I want them um, to have a respect for data and have a respect for that patient in front of them, right? So it's so easy to say, oh, here's Mr. Jones. He's back in the hospital again. He's a frequent flyer, you know, roll your eyes when he comes through because his blood pressure's through the roof again. I want my, I want my students to not just look at, this is Mr. Jones with high blood pressure. I want them to look at Mr. Jones and say, why does Mr. Jones have high blood pressure? That's, that's the type of thinking I want my students to have. Why does Mr. Jones have high blood pressure? You know, what is it about Mr. Jones's um, environment that is causing his high blood pressure? And how can I, as a nurse, help impact those things? Even though I'm working with Mr. Jones and he's in the hospital, um, I don't go home with him, but there are things that we can do when we have our patients and they're in the hospital with us. We can connect them to resources. And I think a lot of times, you know, nurses get so wrapped up in the day-to-day -day care and just squashing fires that they don't think about that. And, and I want the nurses that I have a hand in educating to always think about that. You know, what is it about this person's condition? How can I help them so that they're not back in the, in, in the hospital again? So in this work that you've done, you, you've been doing it for a while, who is that one person or who are those people that have had a tremendous impact on you? Oh, wow. Um, I think about people, first comes to mind is Dr. Loretta Sweet Jamat. And she is very well known for um, her work in HIV AIDS prevention. And, um, a lot of her interventions that she developed around education were in the community. You know, I mean, here's a person who was going into beauty parlors, you know, and like, hey, sister, let me, you get your hair washed. Let me, let me drop something on you, you know? <laughs> and, and that, you know, just looking at her work as she went through was like, wow, you know, we don't have to be in an ivory tower. We need to go to where people are. And, um, so that's, that's had a, she has had a huge impact on me. I've had other member, uh, mentors, um, 
Dr. Jackie Campbell, who has done a lot of work um, with domestic violence and intimate partner violence and looking at how she used her body of work to impact policy. You know, here's a person who was looking at domestic violence and, and then it's like, wow, I got to watch my mentor in front of Congress, you know, addressing Congress on these issues. So a, a great example of somebody taking their science, right, and making a big difference with it. So those are just like a couple of the people, you know, that come to mind. Um, you know, then there's, there's people in my own life, you know, like my mom and dad, right. uh, they're not with us anymore, but they, they were the ones who really instilled in me the sense and um, pride in education that that's not something that we should take lightly. And I think too often, I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but at least in the communities that I've lived in, black and brown folks do take education too lightly. And, you know, there's such power in that. I tell my kids this all the time, you know, even back to the days of slavery, you know, um, white people would rather kill the slave that could read, right. lest you tank all of the other slaves, right? So knowledge is power. And once you've gone to school and once you've gotten that education, you know, nobody can ever take that away from you, that or your name. So guard it and always try to build upon it. And um, education is so important. It's, it's, it's one of the key factors, I think, in social and economic mobility. And so we have to have our children healthy so that they can be in school, stay in school, because like every one day a child is out of school, I think it's like, you know, seven days to catch up or something yeah, ridiculous yeah. like that, you know? And so if I have kids who are sick because, you know, they miss a school, a week of school because of asthma, you know, that's a lot of catch up to do. And so now what happens? Well, maybe they're in a system that just sort of passes them along. You know, there's no stop gap to hold them back. And now we've graduated somebody. Maybe they can read, maybe they can't, maybe they have, you know, numeracy, maybe they don't. Um, do they have the, the, the um, skills to be able to get into a college or a trade school? Those are the things that they're going to need to be able to be self-sustainable, to put food on their table for their families, you know? And so education is really important. And I just ask people to, to think about those things and to be cognizant every single day from keeping kids safe and healthy and in school, and then demanding that there's equity in our educational system. You know, I've been in some schools where there are no books. You think this is 2021, what do you mean? No, there are no books. They have reams of paper and they are photocopying stuff for kids to read. And by the way, when we've run out of paper, then there's no more little book packets for your kids to have. And, you know, being with parents who say, I want my kids to have homework, you know, black parents who say, right. I want my kids to have homework. I know that this is important. Um, nobody's giving them homework, you know? So um, yeah, I'm starting to get hyped up. You can hear it in my voice, but um, those, those are really Im important things. So. Wow. I mean, you, I am an educator. So hearing you say that uh, from the medical field, that's what you do. I, I mean, I'm so encouraged that, um, we got to keep the fight going. There's a lot of work yet to be done in so many fields. And, and so I, now I'm seeing that hours cross over because you're in the schools, And so you see what's happening. And so uh, we're going to have to connect because there's power in your voice. Uh, if we can get together and have a more, a more stronger impact on what's going on with students. So Absolutely. let's keep going. Uh, what's one thing you wish you would have known earlier in your career? Mm. I, I was thinking about this the other day. And I think there would have been two things, um, personally and professionally. Um, first is that it's okay to ask for help. And second, from a professional standpoint, um, find a mentor. Mm. And so I encourage the students that I work with, find a mentor. And it's not just one person. You need a mentor for many, many things. You know, if you are a nurse, you need a mentor who's going to help you with your clinical career. If you move into nursing administration or if you move into academia within nursing, find a mentor who's going to help you um, grow that aspect of your career. You know, um, your finances, your personal finances, who's mentoring you for that? 
you know, um, so I, I have many mentors now, but I think I probably would have been further along um, even now, you know, farther along now than I, than I am. Um, and I have come a long way, but I just think about, wow, how much more could I have done if I had proper mentoring the day I stepped out of nursing school or even while I was in nursing school, right? You know, and I didn't even know that, gee, you're supposed to have a mentor. You're supposed to seek these things. Um, and again, that other piece that it's okay to ask for help. We can't know everything. We cannot do everything. Um, and, it, and it's okay to ask for help. And I have that. I just had this conversation the other day about some of our black and brown students who struggle in school. Mm. And I'm like, why don't they ask for help? You know, and it's sometimes by the time they do come to us, they are like going underwater for the third time. And so there may be very little that we can do for them. And um, I just think that we have to do a better job as a community, as parents, as teachers, letting folks know that asking for help in our community is not a sign of weakness. You know, um, actually it's wisdom, right? How much can you bear? Mm -hmm. um, and, and letting people know that, you know, my plate is full and I can't do anymore right now. So um, I think that's important professionally as well as personally. Um, and I don't know what happened there. I think about my own upbringing and there just wasn't, I didn't see a lot of asking for help in my family. Yeah. So um, I think we need to do a better job of letting our kids know that it's okay and the young people that we interact with know that it's okay. Yeah, I think there's a level of pride there that needs, that wall needs to be broken down a little bit. Absolutely. In community. Um, you've done a lot. So what would you say is your biggest accomplishment to date? Wow. So um, I would say professionally, um, I had the Center for Urban Youth and Families at Rutgers University, and it still exists. So I was the inaugural director and the primary investigator of that center. And it's an interprofessional um, research center that looks at the, the health and well being of, of urban children and their families. And um, just, you know, starting with a little bit of seed funding and growing that to um, something that has an impact on health within the Newark community, but throughout the state. Mm -hmm. And um, that work led to my next big, big, which is um, being inducted as a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing. I mean, that was like pivotal for me. It's, it's um, not that you need confirmation and affirmation from other people, but when you're in the profession, it really is, it's so humbling and such an honor because, um, you know, your colleagues have seen the work that you've done and they acknowledge the impact, you know, the impact that you've had on um, your community and, uh, and the profession. So I would say professionally, those are my two, my two biggest, um, my two biggest things that I'm, that I'm proud of. So now let's look on the other side. So we talked about accomplishment. Let's talk about challenges. Uh, what are some challenges that you faced? And what are those skills that you had to tap into in order to overcome those challenges? I, I will definitely say, um, and I think this is for, uh, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, right? So this is the Black Doctoral Network. And I think um, I'll have an amen corner when I say this from Black and Brown educators that they're, you know, it's race, you know, it's race. And um, being held out of the game, you know, whether it's for tenure, the rules changing. Yeah, there's rules that are written, right? In, in the faculty bylaws and faculty senate. But what are those unspoken things? Yeah. You know, what are those unspoken rules? And so that's been a lot of what I have had to tackle. And, um, you know, the micro and macro aggressions. And so I've had to learn, um, first of all, get a thick skin, right? And I've also, what I tell my students and my kids, I've had to learn to disappoint people. 
Mm-hmm. And so what do I mean by that? So when I'm in a meeting with colleagues and they make these off the cuff remarks or, you know, I'm denied, you know, some opportunity, what is expected of me is that I'm going to wild out, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I disappoint them. I disappoint them at every chance I get. I love that. You know, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep my cool. Um, I'm going to get collected. And if we can't go over the mountain, if we can't go around the mountain, sometimes we have to dig through the mountain and it may take a little bit of time, but we will get to the other side. Mm -hmm. And so that persistence and um, don't give up and surround yourself with people. And a lot of times find out who your allies are. That's what I've had to do. Get allies quickly. Who are the people within my organization that really are, um, you know, could have my best interest. And, you know, I've had to put all this, they don't look like me aside stuff and just get in front of them and let them know, here's my worth and here's what I bring to the table. And this is why I'm important investing in. And so, you know, you build up those allies when those, when those roadblocks come, sometimes you need to go to those allies and say, Hey, this is what I'm facing. And this is what I need from you. You know, this is what I need from you. And um, so, yeah, that's how I've learned how to get around those things. But definitely I try to disappoint as much as possible. (laughs) Learn to disappoint people. Um, So when you set goals, I'm sure you've set many. What are those steps that you take to reach those goals? Well, I've had to learn. you know, because I am a goal setter and a list maker. And um, I would get really disappointed, you know, in the beginning, like, you know, oh my gosh, it's a month later and I haven't, you know, written a book or anything, right? So I still haven't written a book, but, you know, um, I haven't accomplished this one big thing that I wanted to do. And so I think it's important that when we have these goals, they need to align with who we are and where we are right now, right? So if I say, I want to be the president of the United States, well, that's a noble goal and aspiration, but that doesn't align with me and who I am right now. And so I have to think about, you know, what is it that makes me happy? <laughs> what is it that gives me joy? What is it that gives me purpose? And I set my goals along those lines. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it may not be the same goal that you have. You know, at this point in our careers, it's it's not a team sport in a way. You know, it, it always is. We're part of a collective. But in terms of goal setting, you know, we are individuals right now, you know, we are individuals. And so, you know, I think about my legacy and what I want to, you know, leave to the world. And so that's how I set my goals. And then what is this little piece that I need to bite off? Right. So, you know, how do how do I how do I get myself in this position? Well, maybe I need to be part of a board before I can do something else. Okay, how do I get involved in the board? Well, you have to make yourself known. So that means that you need to start volunteering with this agency, you know, let them know who they are, get yourself in front of them. So, you know, you have the big goal and then work back and put the little pieces in. And um, that's that's what I've learned through the years, because it was like I set a goal on the other side of that mountain. But I didn't think that I might need a rope ladder or a bridge to get over there. Right. So uh, I think it's really important to put those and share your goals. But be careful who you share your goals with, because everybody's not happy for you. Most everybody's not happy for you. So, um, you know, and, and I tell people that I mentor, you know, sometimes you have to, you know, don't put all your don't put all your business in the street, because just as there are people who will help you, mm-hmm. there will people who know your goals and they will do everything they can, everything they can to derail you. So, um, you know, find out who's in your corner and how they can help you get to where you need to be. And again, that's the important part about having mentors, share your goals with your mentors and revisit them often, because what may seem like something that you really, really want today, you know, when you look back and revisit those five-year goals, it might be like, that's not aligning with who I am right now. I love what you, when you say, make sure it aligns to who you are and where you are right now. And so Mm -hmm. for me, that speaks about purpose um, and intent. And I think that's important for people to think about those things uh, as they set those goals. So you are a member of the Black Doctoral Network. And it's people like you that I'm always amazed. And I'm so proud that I am a member uh, to meet such brilliant people doing such great work out there. 
So how has the, your affiliation with the Black Doctoral Network uh, enhanced your career and success? Wow, just having a network of super smart people, you know, um, people, I mean, I think I'm a little bit smart, but there are just brilliant people <laughs> within this network. And it was encouraging to me when I found out about the Black Doctoral Network, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago. Um, I think when I first got in, uh, when I first got involved, it was the second year um, because it was the second um, conference that was held in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was, that was really a treat to be able to go there. And I'm thinking, well, you know, what, what might I get from this? But just the level of networking that that brought and it brought me out of my own little sphere, right? So just like you go to educational conferences, I go to nursing conferences, but this was an opportunity to be at a multidisciplinary conference and to be able to talk about, um, you know, issues that were important to me and that, you know what, there's an engineer that may have, you know, some of the same concerns, or there's an educator that may have some of the same concerns or or an economist or so um, it's been a blessing and in our institutions where we are there may only be one or two like I think about where I am right now um, three four black doctorally prepared folks out of nearly a hundred right on on faculty but when you come to the black doctoral network you're surrounded by like peers yeah. And um, that's really encouraging. It's super uplifting, uh, you know. So every minority student that I have ever mentored, including my own daughter, who's getting a PhD right now, I'm like, you have to be a member of the Black Doctoral Network, even if that means me paying that first year's membership fee for them. And um, they've all said, oh, my gosh, this has been so enlightening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to be able to tune in and listen to podcasts and, um, you know, the, the webinars um, and definitely the conferences. Thank goodness for a vaccine. I can't wait to see people uh, no, again in person, no, right? No. Yeah. So if anybody's out there holding out, don't be crazy. Get your vaccine so we can all be together again. <laughs> all right. So it's you guys safe. Got, it's safe. <laughs> you guys got two endorsements right there. One, right. get your vaccine. Two, join the Black Doctoral Network. You heard That's right. Her. And let That's me right. say this. It is true. If you have a daughter that's getting her PhD, black don't crack people. <laughs> black does not. <laughs> Thank you. Oh You're my, my best friend today. Oh my God, black doesn't crack. So black yeah. is black. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Dr. Boyne, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for dropping the nuggets. And thank you for the work that you do. Please tell our viewers and listeners where they can go to learn more about you and the work that you're doing. Right now, I'm about to have a big change, but um, right now I'm at the Medical University of South Carolina. So um, you can look me up there, Bowen, uh, Bowen F, B-O-W-E-N-F, at M-U-S-C dot E-D-U. Or you can find me on Twitter, at Felicia Bowen. And, um, you know, I'm always hanging out on Twitter so we can connect. Um, but thank you very much for having me. Uh, and I'm Looking forward to just continuing on with the Black Doctoral Network. It's getting stronger and stronger and bigger and bigger every year. So Yes, it is. Well, guys, please be sure to stay connected with the Black Doctoral Network and connect with us on all of our social media channels. Thank you for joining us today for the Black Doctor Talk podcast. We hope you will join us again next time. But for now, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and don't forget to tell a friend. Goodbye, guys.